So I know that I've been around a really, really long time. I've lost my hair in the course of my career, but I didn't know that I'd been speaking to people here who were one years old at the time. So I appreciate that uh, uh, introduction. And I'm glad to have an opportunity to be back here on the stage at IIEX. Today, I want to share some thoughts with you that we have at Kantar Futures about the bigger picture or the sort of broader context within which we are attempting to manage our brands, something that we refer to as the future of consumption. And this is actually an initiative that we have just launched uh, at Kantar Futures, and you can find the web link here on the screen. Uh, there are six themes that we're going to be exploring between now and the end of the year, with lots of regularly updated content of white papers and infographics and videos and podcasts and slide decks. So you can find a lot of our detail here uh, on, this, uh, on this website. Uh, but what I want to give you a little bit of a headline view of here this morning is the way in which the broader context of consumption is changing and the impact that that is having on what consumers are looking for in the marketplace. It's something that at Kantar Futures we refer to as the third age of consumption. And you see that this is discussed in our white paper, which is related to the first of these six themes that we'll explore between now and the end of the year. We are just coming out of an age of consumption that was characterized by unlimited expectations and unlimited promise, probably best epitomized by Moore's Law, exponentially increasing growth with no ceiling that technology or engineering could not overcome. But now we are bumping up against capacity. Capacity is the defining characteristic of the third age of consumption, and that means an entirely new approach to the way in which we do business. And for consumers, it means an entirely new approach to the way in which they define the good life or their aspirations about their lifestyles that you could characterize in these four words, live large, carry little which is to say that consumers want to live just as big a life as ever, but they want to do so without all of the baggage that used to come with it in the past. They want a smaller footprint. They want less stuff, less ownership, less responsibility, less upkeep, less anxiety, less debt, less hassle, but with no diminishment of the enjoyment and the reward that they get out of their lifestyles. And this is not just about new needs and wants on the part of consumers. This is a new necessity that we are facing in the marketplace because of the constraints of capacity. And there are three kinds of capacity that we are talking about in the future of consumption. The first of these is cognitive capacity, or the ability of consumers to absorb and process all that we are pushing at them in the marketplace today. You heard a little bit of this in the discussion just a moment ago about sampling, but it's even worse in the broader context of the marketing that we do to consumers in the marketplace. And in work that we have done across Kantar that we call Fragment Nation and is summarized in another white paper you can find on our website about the future of consumption, what we see is that people are trying to keep up. They love marketing. They love advertising. They're spending just shy of 20% more time with all media today than they were in 2008. And yet, the number of ads that they are confronting in the marketplace has gone up 120% since 2008. And it's not just ads. Brands are up 30%. The amount of space devoted to retail is up 25%. We are outstripping the capacity of consumers to keep up. So it's no surprise that one-third of consumers say they feel like we are stalking them online because we are stalking them online. Or that one-third of consumers say they look away from their screen every time an ad appears on it. Or that one-quarter of consumers and growing say that they have installed ad-blocking software on their devices. We are at the outer edges of the capacity of people to keep up.
And it's not just cognitive capacity. We are also faced with the diminishing capacity of the global economy to sustain growth as we have known it and mastered it in the past. Discussed in a white paper we published around this time last year called Defying Gravity. Now, economists debate this issue as one related to structural factors that affect productivity growth and declining returns on innovation. And that, of course, is a very furious debate but I liken it to science fiction because there's no way of predicting the future of innovation and invention. It's all speculation. So the McKinsey Global Institute took a different angle to get into this debate. And in their analysis, they said, let's just hold productivity growth constant and see what the impact is on economic possibilities just from declining global population growth. And what they found was, just from declining global population growth, holding productivity constant, the global economy over the next 50 years will grow on average each year 40% less than it grew in the prior 50 years. And this also answers the question that economists are debating because this tells us how much increase in innovation we need in order to overcome this loss from declining population growth. Innovation would have to grow 80% more than it has in the past, and not even the most optimistic economists believe that that is possible. And if that's not sobering enough, the third area of capacity will definitely sit you up straight in your chair, and that is resource capacity. Resources on the planet simply cannot support more growth the way we've done it before. The Stockholm Resilience Center published a framework of nine planetary limits in 2009, and in their analysis, they discovered that then, almost a decade ago, that we had already exceeded four of those limits, two of which were core. Now, I don't know what your view of global warming is. That was certainly one of the four that had already been exceeded. But even holding that aside, there are still eight other reasons why resource capacity represents a constraint on our ability to do business in the future the same way that we have done business in the past. Whatever you may think of the past, the future is going to be driven by this intersection of capacity constraints that we face going forward. And the sweet spot of success, as we think about it, is going to be the intersection of these kinds of capacity. This is where we are going to have to define our way of doing business going forward. And when we do that, we will discover a new era. E-R-A, our little acronym, a new era of opportunity for brands. This is the third age of consumption, one in which growth and value and competitive edge will be driven by experiences, relationships, and algorithms. Experiences are what consumers want from brands. They don't want the thing anymore. They want the payoff. They don't want the product. They want the benefit. And in part, this means a decoupling of products and benefits, which we are already seeing in the marketplace today. The ride has been decoupled from the car, content from the device, sleep from the bed, uh, the shopping cart from the store, reality from the virtual. This decoupling is going on all around us, and we have to quit thinking about success in the marketplace as tied to things. That's baggage that consumers want to carry little of going forward. Relationships are what people want from their lifestyles. They want more connection with other people, not more connection with our brands. Not things, not ideologies, not stuff, People want relationships with other people. And I want to say a little bit more about this here this morning, but let me uh, come back to it here in just a second. 
The third element of the third age of consumption is algorithms, and this is what people want from marketing. They don't have any more time and headspace to spend with more marketing from us. They are unable right now to filter all of the choices we make to available to them in the marketplace to find the right fit. And so they are turning to algorithms to do that for them instead. Our programmatic marketing is being met by consumers doing programmatic consumption. Now, this is a completely different speech that I give with thoughts about what this means for the future. But if you've heard me talk about this before, you know that what I think it means is, one, we'll have to advertise to algorithms going forward, not people. Two, that we will uh, have to quit thinking about consideration sets as a metric of success because the algorithms aren't going to present consumers with choices. They're going to make one decision for people. And finally, more of our marketing is going to have to be in the usage part of the cycle, not in the buying part of the cycle. Algorithms change the way in which we have to think about this business. But as I said, that's another speech. Today, I want to begin to sort of draw this to a close here this morning by illustrating a little bit of what I mean by this new era by focusing some on relationships. And let's think a little bit about how we got here. On the left-hand side, you see a pyramid that represents the evolution of the consumer marketplace in this country and other developed nations since the end of World War II. At the end of the war, we had been through two decades of austerity, and we entered a material marketplace. People had done without stuff, now they wanted stuff. And we bought so much stuff that academics began to worry that our values were being corrupted by materialism. And we did that until we had enough stuff, and in the 80s and 90s, we entered the experience marketplace. And we still talk about that as if that's the characteristic of the marketplace today, when in fact we are now in a social marketplace. And the evolution of the marketplace matters because the locus of value has changed. In the material marketplace, we realized our premium from selling the product. In the experience marketplace, we realize it from the service we delivered. Both of those things are now commoditized. And what's driving growth going forward is the benefit of the social marketplace, which is relationships. And you see this very clearly in the data. These are Kantar retail data derived from BLS data that show the percentage of the pocketbook that is spent on goods versus services. And you see the gap increasing over time, largely because of the commoditization of goods over this period of time. This is the what that people are buying. The top of the pyramid these days is about how people are buying these things, and that's driven by relationships. This is data from Kurt Salmon Associates that shows the, uh, the growth of e-commerce and the role that social commerce is playing in that growth. Social commerce is growing at a rate twice as fast as e-commerce as a whole and represents the basic potential of that marketplace going forward. And not just e-commerce, but all retail as a whole. We are seeing this shift to a marketplace of relationships. In fact, we are seeing what we refer to at Kantar Futures as an uprising of allegiances. There is this uh, um, uh, uh, consensus among pundits these days, that America is falling apart, that we are more disconnected than ever. In fact, and it's another speech, that's false. At Kantar Futures, what we see is that America has never been more connected, more networked, and more joined up than it is today. It looks different than it did in the past, with sharper elbows, but there is more focus on allegiances than ever before. Again, take a look back to understand where we're headed in the future. In the past, what we saw was the preeminence of individuality. America, data are clear, show that America fell apart in the 60s and the 70s with the rise of individuality as the driving force in the marketplace. We were focused on being authentic to our true selves, and we were willing to trade off any social convention in order to get there. These days, for a variety of reasons, social selves are now as important as our individual selves. Think about a marketer back in the 70s and 80s. You would ask yourself the question, what kind of people am I marketing to? Not what kind of consumers, but what kind of people? And you would say, it's a whole bunch of individuals who want to express themselves. So I have to offer products and services that enable people to be fully self-expressive.
Today, when you're a marketer asking that question, you see people who are interested in their social selves. And so you say, I need to offer products and services that enable people to fully express their social selves. That's the relationship marketplace of today. And it means our business model has to look less brand centric and more relationship central. It's less about connecting consumers to our brands and more about facilitating and fostering the ability of people to have relationships with other people. And that means delivering social currency that people can spend on others in their lifestyles relationships as the value in the marketplace. And broadly speaking, what the third age of consumption means for the future is that we have to think very differently about how we do business. It's not about yet another new product in the category. It is instead about new business models that are consistent with the capacity constraints in the marketplace that enable us to deliver value to consumers in ways that will facilitate their ability to live large and carry little. And that is the future of consumption. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, we have time for uh, just a couple of questions and uh, I'll leave it to the audience here because I'm a bit overwhelmed. As always, great, great job. <laughs> well, you were just one years old. I know, then, I, so. know <laughs> I know, I know, I <laughs> know. Questions, comments, arguments? I'm just eight now, so. <laughs> um. Yes. Just to sum up, what you're saying is that this, we are, at the same time, more connected through social media, more individualistic, but yet more and more independent on the handshake. <laughs> Well, so let me just say uh, a little bit about this. So, so there's, a, there's a visual image that I often use to describe this. So think of a white space with a bunch of individual dots on it, all individual people. In the 30s and 40s and 50s, what was described at the time was a sense of national community and national identity. Lots of differences, but everybody conformed to sort of a broader sense uh, of identity. And that's one big circle that surrounds all of those individual dots. That circle got erased in the 60s and 70s. Broad authority became invalid. It became invalid because the cultural experience of the time moved beyond it and because authority went rogue. All of the things that happened in the 70s that undermined our trust in big authorities. And then we went through a couple of decades where it was just all these individual dots individual people trying to maximize their own authentic selves. And authenticity became the vogue term for all of these decades. What has emerged over the last decade are circles again, but not one circle, but lots of smaller circles that surround little clusters of dots in this broader map. And this looks more like kinship than it does community, and that's how we refer to it. So it's not community per se, but it is connectedness, and it feels a lot more like blood ties. And if you can imagine, blood ties come with sharper elbows, and that's what we're feeling these days. So America isn't falling apart. America is coalescing into more and more of these individual, smaller circle units of kinship and connection that really define the ways in which people then choose reference points and authority figures in their lives. It's much more diffuse. Uh, people are looking peer to peer more than they are to big authorities. They're looking more local. Uh, all of these things are going on and they don't represent a falling apart. They represent a new form of coming together and figuring out how to navigate the kinship world as opposed to Think looking for a return to the old community world is the challenge that we face. Great. Well, okay, thank, thank you, you very, very much. much. Appreciate it. <laughs>